Today, we'll be highlighting an emerging technology in the management of prostate cancer, one that spares healthy tissue, thereby minimizing side effects that can even be delivered by urologists in the office setting. So stay tuned. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On the podcast, we'll be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. The Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. I'm excited to be teaming up this week with Clinical Laser Thermia Systems Americas for this week's episode. CLS is an innovative medical device company who has been at the forefront of developing precise and effective interventional healthcare solutions and have developed the CLS Thermal Therapy System for image-guided focal laser ablation. We'll be chatting with CLS president today, Michael Mignani. His background encompasses over 20 years in corporate management positions within the life sciences industry, successfully recruiting and leading numerous teams in product development, corporate strategy, business development, and commercialization capacities. Michael completed his graduate studies at the MIT Sloan School of Management in Harvard Medical School in a unique curriculum called the Biomedical Enterprise Program. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology from the University of California, San Diego. Michael, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me today, Dr. Bowman. Michael, could you first tell us a bit about CLS America? Yeah, certainly. So CLS America is actually the U.S. subsidiary of our Swedish parent company, CLSAB. That company was founded back in 2009 to develop and commercialize focal laser ablation technology, which is used for treating a variety of different tumors. Prostate is is certainly a large one. We received our CE mark and our first 510K clearance back in 2015, and to date we've treated a little bit over 300 patients. Probably about two-thirds of those have had prostate cancer. And you know, our second largest indication is what we kind of call brain, it's sort of an amalgamation of, we use it to treat GBMs, glioblastoma, as well as refractory epilepsy as well. And I joined the company in the fall of 2019, and I've been really pushing to translate this technology into the urologist's office setting. So in the past, pretty much all of our cases had been done in a gantry, in an MR, with an interventional radiologist serving as our primary customer. And, you know, right around towards the end of 2019, we're starting to see the development and fruition of a lot of other enhanced ultrasound imaging platforms. You've got MR ultrasound fusion, micro ultrasound. There's a lot of other ancillary, even Promaxo, other imaging technologies that are coming into the foray into the office setting that we thought would be able to allow us to translate our laser into the office and out of the entry. I see that as a win-win. It's a win for the urologist. They maintain continuity of care with their patients. They certainly have, it provides access to another revenue stream, another procedure that they can offer. And from the patient's perspective as well, they don't have to lose their continuity of care. They don't have to get sent over to the hospital and sit in a bubble for a few hours, which as you can imagine during COVID was certainly not high on their priority list. Well, as you mentioned, urologists are increasingly recognizing the value of being able to offer targeted focal therapy as an alternative treatment for prostate cancer, inappropriate candidates. And Could you walk us through the device components of the thermal therapy system, including how it works in targeting prostate cancer? Yeah, sure. So I'll specify, I'll focus on how it's deployed in a urological setting. There's some other hardware that comes into play when we start talking about working in the brain that's not applicable for today's talk. So really the main components, there's really five components. We have first off the laser, the the mobile laser unit, which is our power supply. And then there's the consumables kind of get broken into four different categories. So our laser energy is actually introduced into the body through a fiber optic cable. We refer to that as an applicator. Uh, It's basically just a fiber optic shaft, and there's a little glass aperture at the end where the laser energy can come through. That applicator is deployed or introduced into the body through a standard introducer and stylet. We introduce that transperineally, which is for the non-physicians listening. That's the area between the, the anus and the scrotum. So it's deployed through the standard introducer. 
the stylet is removed, the applicator is inserted, and that's all being guided by visualization through the MR ultrasound fusion or micro ultrasound. And last but not least, we've realized that it is really important to monitor temperature during ablations, especially when you're ablating malignant tissue. And so we have developed temperature probes that we can use in this system. They serve two functions. They made sure that you have achieved the adequate temperature for uh, destroying the healthy malignant tissue. They can also serve as a safety guard function. So we can actually set them to operate in kind of a closed loop system where it will automatically turn off if the temperature reaches a certain temperature. So you don't get it too hot because that can also cause problems. Now, what are some of the advantages of targeted focal laser ablation for prostate cancer? Yeah, so I'll answer that in two parts. I think when first, just looking at focal therapy in general, really the main advantage as I see it of focal therapy in general is it's going to really offer patients who have early to you know intermediate stage disease a third option. Right now, patients who are diagnosed in that range really have two choices, and they're both pretty extreme. Essentially, the doctors will either do nothing They'll just do watchful waiting or active surveillance, or they'll undergo an aggressive therapy such as a radical prostatectomy or whole gland radiation. So there are pros and cons to both of those. There's really no middle ground. That's really where the proponents of focal therapy are really trying to say there's an area here. There's a compromise. There's another alternative we can do. Now, within the realm of focal therapy, you know, obviously, I believe there are several distinct advantages that laser offers over other energy sources. There's really three when it, that come to mind. First and foremost, just the physical properties of the laser allow it to have a very tight demarcation in terms of where it ablates. So the range of tissue, the amount of tissue that you could see between what is completely necrotic and destroyed and dead tissue and completely healthy viable tissue is about a half a millimeter. And when you compare that to some of the other energy sources, you could see three, four, five millimeters of sort of what they call gray zone. You don't really know if it's alive. You don't know if it's dead. And when you're talking about trying to destroy malignant cells, that's not good. You also have sort of that ice ball effect or that runaway kind of effect where when you turn the energy sources off, some of the other ones, they continue to propagate. With the laser, you turn it off, it stops instantly. And so you have a very precise ablation zone. Another big advantage we have is because we're introduced transperineally, we don't rely on introduction through a natural orifice, such as the urethra or the rectal wall. Those really restrict where you can treat, where the lesions need to be in order to be effective at treating with those energy sources. It's hard to send sound waves a long distance from a natural orifice, whereas with us, we could pretty much get that fiber almost anywhere into the organ and treat ostensibly anywhere. Now, I'll say that, I'll walk that back a minute with a caveat that we obviously don't encourage patients or physicians to treat patients if a lesion is too close to a critical structure. But in terms of access, we have pretty much a wide range of abilities to get almost anywhere in the organ. And then last but not least, the procedure is very fast. In the hands of a skilled operator, we see typically a procedure is no more than 45 minutes. And that's the time the patient walks in the room to the time the patient ambulates and they go into a recovery room. It's the actual procedure is half that. So you compare that to some of these other energy sources that can take a half a day. It just helps with the efficiency. It allows the urologist to treat multiple patients in the same amount of time. It just improves the office efficiency. Well, who would you consider as an appropriate candidate then for this technology? So the sweet spot for our technology is really what we call a favorable intermediate patient. That'd be a Gleason 7, ideally a 3 plus 4. We do treat several patients who have 4 plus 3. Some of our earlier studies even treated 3 plus 3s, and we even have doctors who will occasionally treat a Gleason 8 or, or above. Typically, those latter cases are rare cases. They'll happen where you have a young patient who is diagnosed, they have an aggressive disease, but they have an active sexual life. They refuse radical therapy. And because of that diagnosis, you know, active surveillance isn't an option. It's rare, but it does happen. Well, I'm sure a lot of our listeners looking at some of the benefits we've discussed, got to think about too, what are some of the potential risks with the treatment then? Yeah, of course. I mean, as with any intervention, there certainly are. There is the potential for risks and we have to recognize that and we work hard to mitigate them. I think in the case of focal laser ablation, probably the biggest concern that we have is heating the tissue near a critical structure. We have to be very cognizant of the fact that when you're deploying this laser, it does have the ability to heat any tissue, and it will not distinguish whether that's the right place or the wrong place. We've instituted and implemented safeguards. The temperature probes that I mentioned are a critical component of that. If you're treating a lesion that's anywhere near a critical structure, we highly encourage the doctor to place a temperature probe in between the ablation zone, the outer boundary of that zone, and the critical structure. And you can actually turn on a function where it basically serves as a guard, and you can set a temperature and you say, if this gets above 45 degrees centigrade or whatever temperature you don't want it to exceed, it will shut the laser off. That's probably the biggest risk that we see. You do have the potential if you don't use a temperature probe and they do get excessively heated. That's where you run into issues with potentially ED. 
If you overheat around the neurovascular bundle, you could end up with a rectal fistula if you're treating right up against the rectal wall. Those are some of the big ones. Urethral stricture is another one if you're, if you're ablating near the urethra. I know CLS has a mobile services model or MSP model for urologists. I know a lot of our urology listeners would like to know how this model works for a urologist practice. Yeah. So the U.S. healthcare system is kind of a double-edged sword. Obviously, I'm thrilled to live here and to be able to work in this environment because we do have access to a lot of emerging technology. The problem is that the reimbursement infrastructure (laughs) that goes along with this new technology is often very much lagging. So it could take several years for reimbursement to catch up. And that makes it really challenging for a urologist to adopt a new technology, especially if there's a capital equipment component, sort of an upfront cost, like there is with our laser unit. And so what we've seen is in certain fields, and urology is certainly one of them, companies are deploying this business model where they basically can just rent the equipment, either on a per case or more likely a daily fee. So we would bring the laser with us and all the disposables. We would bring one of our clinical associates along to help tech the case, and they'll help walk you through the procedure. And you know, all of that is done for sort of a fixed fee. And we found that that's a really good way. It gives the urologist an opportunity to test drive the technology. From our side, obviously having our hand in the, in the room, and that certainly helps to guide and improve the clinical outcomes because our people who are doing this have done this for years. So that helps to improve that. And it gives them an opportunity to just try it out. And, you know, I've seen urologists also adopt somewhat of a concierge model to provide early access to some of these emerging technologies. And it sounds like some of your customers have already followed this path. Absolutely. Yeah. And we fully support customers who have adopted this business model. I see it as a way to provide cutting edge technology or giving the best possible healthcare in an office setting without having to worry about prior auths or delays in insurance payment. It just makes the whole operation run much more smoothly. And that dovetails nicely as well with the MSP, because as I said before, this way, they don't have to have any capital equipment. There's no financial outlays. They could just get up and running very quickly. I mean, our first site was Dr. C. Joe Paracottle with a bond down in Orlando. He started running cases after AUA. He's already done almost 20 of them, and he's just up and running, and it didn't take long at all. Well, you know, after listening to learning about this technology, I know a lot of our listeners will appreciate also hearing what they could expect with undergoing the procedure. Could you walk us through the procedure, including what a patient can really expect during the procedure as well as the recovery phase? Yeah, sure. So our procedure is performed transperineally, which again is that space between the scrotum and the anus for the people who are listening who don't have a clinical background. Typically, the patient is laying on their back with their legs up in the air. It's called the dorsolithotomy position. The doctor will provide local sedation in that region, and then they can either use nitrous, or we've had some doctors who've actually opted to use what they call max sedation. They'll bring in either a nurse or an anesthesiologist, and they'll actually put the patient to sleep. Again, that just depends on the setup in the office. There's regulations in different states. That's sort of the range of what we see in terms of anesthesia. In terms of the procedure itself, the laser applicator is introduced either through a grid and a stepper or freehand, depending on the physician's preference. They can visualize that using the fusion, the MR ultrasound fusion. Once the laser is put into place, they can insert temperature probes around critical structures to be able to preserve those and and also to monitor that the adequate temperature is ablated, it's reached. The actual ablation typically takes about four minutes. It's fairly quick. Again, kind of time in to time out is probably under 45 minutes for the patient in that actual treatment room. Usually what we see is the patients will leave. They'll have a catheter that'll stay in for between three to five days just until the swelling kind of subsides. There's a little bit of transient pain in that immediate area, but they can resume light activities as soon as the following day. We actually had a patient who was treated and a week later he went out and won a golf tournament. And when he talked to the doctor, he said it actually this really improved his golf swing. And I'm sure some of that's probably psychological. He just didn't have to worry about, you know, cancer wasn't on his mind. But I think that you can't get a better recommendation for a quick recovery than that. What I've found is that men and their loved ones are becoming increasingly more proactive in learning about and seeking out the latest technology for prostate cancer treatment. They're even willing to travel out of state if needed to get the treatment that best aligns with their personal preferences. And I suspect it'll be no different for the CLS thermal therapy system for targeted focal laser ablation. Much like with other technologies I offer in my practice where we've been typically, you know, one of the first to market in offering new technologies. I have patients that will travel in from out of state, and I suspect we'll see a similar response with this technology. I want to congratulate you and your team at CLS uh, Americas for really bringing this technology to market. It's exciting to have this emerging technology that spares the healthy tissue, thereby minimizing side effects that 
can be, and even be delivered in the clinic setting too. That's exciting. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. It's funny you bring that up, Dr. Pullman. We actually did have, we had a case exactly like that. There was a, a patient up in Alaska who tracked me down. I think he got my cell phone number off of a press release and he wanted to, he was scheduled to get a cryo at another leading institute. He was willing to travel for that, but he really wanted to have the laser. And the study was happening in Miami and the doctor didn't want him to enroll. He was worried he wasn't going to follow through. He wasn't going to come to the follow through points and we'd lose the data. And after talking to him extensively, he gave me his pinky swear. He would follow through. He'd come down every time he had to. He was enrolled. He was successfully treated. He's had a fantastic response. And he still continues to reach out to me periodically to thank me for allowing him to participate in the study. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's pretty cool. So any final thoughts today for our listeners? Yeah, you know, I mean, well, first off, thanks for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to discuss the technology with you. I think we at CLS are extremely excited about this technology and what it could potentially offer as an alternative treatment option for these patients who really have been stuck between a rock and a hard place in terms of other options. The fact that the laser's already been proven in a neurosurgical environment, we think that bodes very well for prostate. The level of precision required for brain surgery is very extreme uh, and it works great there. So we think it's going to work really well here. I think the adoption and kind of mobilization of this MSP model has already shown, it's already demonstrated that it's something that the doctors are very interested in. I think it'll provide an opportunity for for them to get a test drive before they have to commit to a large capital uh, purchase. And last but not least, we do have a very seasoned clinical team who's out there who's eager to help urologists if they want to try to adopt this in their practice. So if anybody's interested in learning more, please feel free to reach out to us at clinicallaser.com. Michael, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today on the Prostate Health Podcast. Thanks again for getting our listeners up to speed. You bet. Thanks for having me, Dr. Coleman. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. For those of you wanting to dive in even deeper, make sure to check out the Prostate Health Academy, which offers comprehensive and easy to navigate lessons that I have prepared for you. There's also an active private community forum, and I am there every day providing support, insight in answering questions. To learn more, just go to www.prostatehealthacademy.com and click on join now. Well, that's it for today. We will see you at the next episode.